Thank you very much for that introduction. It's a long walk <laughs> from there. So good afternoon, everybody. Go Toronto. <laughs> I'm, from, I'm from Calgary originally. I, I now live in Silicon Valley, but I'm Canadian at heart. So there you go. I'm here to talk about um, beyond the glass ceilings. And you may wonder what that means. Let me start by giving you an overview of my work for the past seven to eight years. So first is Technovation Challenge. Here, we're building a pipeline of young girls to enter STEM careers. This is a 12-week after-school program. And what we're doing is sparking an interest in girls as young as eight years old to take an interest in science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, what we say to the girls is look around you, wherever you are, whether you're in Armenia or whether you're in Zimbabwe, look around you. And if you think there's a problem in your society, in your community, and you think you can solve it using a mobile app, then we will help you build it. And the way we do that is we teach them how to do uh, mobile app development through MIT's App Inventor program. And wrapped around the MIT's App Inventor program, we, we put in entrepreneurship skills from the lean development cycle. And so then these girls learn how to make an app, and they learn how to be entrepreneurs. And we teach them things like, OK, so you've identified a problem that you're going to solve using uh, technology. How big is the problem? What's the size of the market? Who are your competitors? Are you going to be better than them? How are you going to be better than them? What's your edge? What's, what's your um, spark, right? And so from a very young age, they're starting to think of things like this. And the apps they come up with will blow your mind, literally blow your mind. I'll give you two examples. The first one, and both of these won the, this is a competition, and both, both these won the prize. So the first one was from Moldova. And here, a team of girls were realizing that a lot of their friends were not coming to school um, regularly. Why was that? Well, they were ill, and they were ill from hepatitis A. And why were they ill from hepatitis A? It's because they were drinking tainted water. A lot of their wells were um, you know, not safe to drink from. They would drink from them, get sick, and, and miss school for a lot of time. So they decided to build an app that would monitor the um, pureness of the water. And then very simply, um, so every day somebody would monitor it. And, and very simply, they could send a message to say, OK, the east well on this side of the city, don't drink it because it's tainted. Make sure you avoid it. This is a team of young girls doing things like this for the community. But let me give you another example. As you know, in our world, there are not sanitation facilities for everybody, right? We're used to having two or three bathrooms in our house or a bathroom wherever we want, right? Here at the convention center, walk down the street, you can go to Starbucks, you can go anywhere. In a lot of places in the world, that is just not possible. In Nigeria, it's one of those places. So these, this team of girls built a app called um, Lag Toilet, Lagos Toilet, right? And basically what they did was they uh, borrowed the Airbnb model, right? When you're not using something, why don't you rent it out? You make some money, and, and the other people can use it. So they built the Airbnb model called Lag Toilet, and some of the outhouses in you know, uh, sort of more populated areas were then being used for people who didn't have access to sanitation. These are young girls. They're solving problems with tech that a lot of people are trying to do. Um, this is a, so the um, Technovation Challenge is a com competition, as I said. And if you sort of win in your city or your region, then you progress to the semifinalists. And then the finalists come to Silicon Valley to pitch and present in front of real VCs and judges. And then the prize money allows them to develop their apps when they go home. Last year, um, the world pitch was held at Google headquarters. And the CEO of um, Google, Sundar Pichai, came and gave the keynote. And he had a really good message for both the girls who had made it, uh, but also girls everywhere, uh, not just Technovation Challenge. And basically, he said, look, there is a spot for young girls and women in engineering, right? And there's a spot for them at Google. And he did this not just because he loves Technovation, but he did this in response to the Damore memo. Do you guys remember the Damore memo? Uh, this was an engineer at Google who said that women are not 
uh, biologically or <laughs> emotionally ready to be engineers. It costs a bit of a fur, because you know, we can do mostly everything men can do, including code. Um, so anyway, Sundar sort of found it really useful to be able to say that message at our, at our event. Technovation is now in over 100 countries, and we're growing, and we hope to reach girls in every country. The second program that I'm involved in is uh, Tech Women. So this is more at a country level. It's a country level initiative. So the US State Department has put this program called Tech Women, and it brings in women who are in senior technology roles to Silicon Valley to meet their counterparts in, in technology companies there. And the idea is to create a robust network of women in tech outside the US to women in tech in the US. And you can imagine there's a lot of exchange, both culturally but also technologically. And then when the women go back, they are able to make an impact to the younger generation that's coming behind them, right? So it's a very good program, women from 21 countries, uh, from the Middle East and North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Central Asia. So we're having an impact there. And the, and the third thing is more at a global focus. So in 2016, I was appointed to the United Nations High Level Panel for Women's Economic Empowerment. And what they wanted to do was to um, understand why it is that women in work, you know, at work, uh, weren't progressing, and what could we do to make them progress more. And so that panel had the, the um, input of a lot of people, like the World Bank, and the World Economic Forum, the International Monetary Fund, um, you know, International Labor Organization, et cetera. It also had lots of NGOs who work for informal workers. It had heads of, five, heads of five states. And then it also had a representation from the Silicon Valley. And that's where I came in. And so our focus was to see what we could understand and learn at country level, right, about the digital inclusion of women. And what we did was we brought together a working group of countries, right, whose half the population is women, and companies, all the tech companies. And we brought them together to form a working group to, to do an ecosystem of supply and demand. What's working, what's not working? Countries know how many women they have. Countries know where they want to go. Countries know um, what kind of resources they want to put in. The companies want customers, and they, they want their products to be used. And so we tried to meld that together and it's not easy, it's huge, it's a massive, complicated thing, but we did come up with some recommendations which were presented to the United Nations General Assembly in 2017, and we hope that it will um, you know, trickle down um, and make a difference. And I think Canada is sort of one of the uh, you know, really sort of active um, countries who, who's taking rec those recommendations and trying to put them into place in its country. So overall, the impact of these efforts are important, especially because technology touches every aspect of our lives. But let me be very clear about this. We are fighting a battle. We are playing a catch-up game. And what do I mean by that? What we're doing is we're trying to get women to enter into these very tall hierarch hierarchical structures which have CEO levels, right? The C-suite at the top and the managers in the, in, in, you know, underneath them and all these glass ceilings. And we're building pipelines and we're trying to put in women to sort of break the ceilings and keep knocking at them going up, right? Everybody knows this, right? It's super clear. It's going to take us a very long time to get any parity there. But there is good news, and, and this is what really excites me today. And so the good news is that the internet is evolving. And the internet is evolving in a very fundamentally different way. And I think you guys all know about it, but maybe think about it in, in this particular way. People are tired of having to deal with autocracies and, and centralized, gov centralized governing structures, right? That's what's happening in a lot of our internet world. And there is a real interest and effort in looking at decentralized, right? Decentralized, more democratic, more level playing fields. And it's happening. And some of these you already know about. Look at Wikipedia. This is a system where there are tons of co contributors, right? You don't need permission, right? Tons of contributors set up by a community, very useful to everybody. 
The other one is the open source movement. We're all familiar with the open source movement. It's been there for a long time. You write code, you submit it, other people can take it and use it, right? But, but there's a whole set of new technologies that has come up now in the last two to three years, and I would like to branch them under something called Web3. Web3. So these technologies are different and new in two ways. The first way is that they have business models built around them, which means you can make money from them if you participate and, and, and how much you participate, you know, online. And the second and most fundamental difference about these is that they build the rules of engagement in the software. So if you think about blockchain, right? Blockchain's everywhere now. And blockchain began as a way to transfer money because it has rules of engagement in it and they were all very transparent and you could see it from point A to point Z, right? Which makes it very secure. The rules of engagement, the governance was built in the software. Now, on top of the blockchain, people are building things for contracts. People are moving their entire supply chains onto the blockchain. And there, in this Web3 area, there are so many um, startups that are bubbling up. It's in its infancy. Web3 is in its infancy. Lots of start startups are bubbling up. Lots of them will fail. A lot of them will survive. What I want you to keep in mind is that at one time, the big behemoths that rule us right now, GAFA, you've heard of the word GAFA, Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple, they're the overlords of the internet society that we live in today. At one point, they were startups. Keep that in mind. At one point, they were startups. So there are startups that are bubbling up today, right? Some will, some will die, some will, some will really become. What I want us to do, all of us, is to make sure that we shift our gaze from knocking on these ceilings and trying to bring them down and trying to integrate into them, but shift it just a little bit on this side to say, wow, this is a whole different way of doing things. This is not a, a, an autocracy, this is a meritocracy. This is where rules are written in software. Right? This is where you can have a social media experience that doesn't allow you to give up your privacy or your personal information. And so anyway, my message is that we continue to work on our efforts to break glass ceilings, but also shift our gaze to engage in Web 3.0 technologies for a fundamentally new way of working in technology. Thank you.